It's not been the best of weekends for the Prime Minister after a raft of resignations from his top team. So, how's Monday morning looking for him? His wife's under verbal attack and reports today of a delay to plans to fix the NHS backlog. The Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, on the show shortly. Plus, we'll be talking to the Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth. It is Monday the 7th of February. NHS backlog has a last-minute intervention from the Treasury, delayed plans to tackle it. A brutal campaign by bitter ex-officials. Boris Johnson's wife Carrie hits back after being accused of meddling as the Prime Minister tries to stem the flow of Tories turning against him. The French president is off to Moscow for talks with President Putin, still hopeful that dialogue can prevent further conflict here in Ukraine. Behind bars, the children as young as 12 in overcrowded cells held by the Taliban. Our special correspondent Alex Crawford reports from Afghanistan. Welcome back. Australia will finally reopen its borders to all vaccinated travellers this month after nearly two years. <laughs> And gun salutes for the Queen. We'll take you through today's celebrations marking Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee. A new twist as tennis player Pong Shui denies she ever accused anyone of sexual assault in her first interview with independent media. FA Cup shocks Nottingham Forest knock out the holders Leicester, while non-league Boreham Wood reach the last 16. Also on the programme for you this morning. We skewed over 400 miles to the South Pole, carrying all of our own kit, and we're now standing on the highest mountain in Antarctica, Mount Vincent. Mission to the ends of the earth. We meet the disabled war veteran conquering the world's toughest expeditions. Striker Pose will speak to a model with Down syndrome who's signed with a major agency after being inspired by a Vogue cover. Really looking forward to chatting to her and her mum a little bit later on. Good for her. Morning, everybody. What a week it is going to be for the Prime Minister. One of his right-hand men is with us. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Spoiler alert, no Sue Gray or Met, I'm going to mention, throughout the course of this interview. What? I know, can you believe it? Let's start with the NHS backlog instead. Uh, your plan, well, the, the booking a treatment on an app. How does that work? Yeah, so the, because of uh, COVID, the NHS rightly focused on COVID patients and it has meant, sadly, that the, the waiting list has, has risen significantly. And I, and I have to tell you, I think the waiting list is going to continue to rise for a while until it starts to fall. And the to reason... What? Uh, we, we can't be sure. And the reason is because we estimate about eight to nine million people stayed away from the NHS because they were asked to. They did the right thing. But we want them to come back. We, I want them all to come back uh, because I want them to know the NHS is there, it's open uh, for them. But as they do, of course, that's going to create more pressure. And my job, the NHS's job, is to, to get through that elective backlog, that COVID backlog, as quickly as possible as we can. And what we're announcing today is that part of that plan will include a new online service. It's called My Plan Care. And it will mean that every individual on the waiting list in England will be able to see online exactly where they are on the waiting list, what the average weight is in the area, and other information about how they can prepare for their treatment. The importance of this is that Understandably, many people will be anxious and stressful you know, about their position on the waiting list. It's perfectly understandable, and we want to provide as much transparency as possible. Of course, alongside this, there's lots else going on. We're investing a record billions of pounds in the NHS to get through that COVID backlog, including investment, for example, in things like the new community diagnostic centres. Already, they've done some 400,000 extra diagnostics. They'll do an extra four and a half million by 2025. So there's a lot of investment going in. I just want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to, to help people with their health and care, no matter where they live or who they are. And I thought for the families of those that didn't make it because they were waiting and sadly uh, they've succumbed to their illness. Well, sadly, of course, that, that it's happened. I talked about that, uh, of course, just on, on Friday when I launched the, a new call for evidence for a new cancer plan. I want to do a new 10-year uh, cancer plan. But when I talked about that and, and, and just preparing for that, 
you know, we, we think there's at least around 50,000 people when it comes to cancer that sadly didn't come forward, they haven't come forward uh, because of COVID. And, and in some cases, there's been devastating consequences. Mm. And a thought for the families, what would you say to them? Well, I, I think that, of course, my heart goes out to anyone that's been affected by that and their families, their, their loved ones, their friends. And uh, I, I would just want to reassure people that inside government, working with our friends in the NHS, we're doing everything we can to get services back up and running, getting them back to normal. Uh, unfortunately, because of the Omicron a variant which we've all now obviously all know about just in the last few weeks that's had another impact as well but we're we're getting on with this and we will also shortly be publishing a very ambitious your know, full elective recovery plan okay um, i was reading in my telegraph newspaper this morning that the uh, plan is the nhs backlog plan is not coming today because you've hit a roadblock with the treasury well it's not coming today because we had a roadblock with omicron uh, omicron where i had actually planned to publish the plan in in december and we were almost there. We're agreeing it finally with the NHS and, and across government. Uh, but because of Omicron, we rightly changed our focus, especially to, to boosters and to, to folks of that. And I, we obviously did the right thing. It makes us now the freest country in Europe. And we're heading the other side of Omicron. Okay. But we will publish the plan shortly. The reason I ask that is because Matthew Taylor, who you know, who is uh, the NHS Confederation, has said on Twitter, increasingly getting the sense that Johnson now faces the same but more intense and short-term challenge that uh, Tony Blair had in his third term. We've got this graphic, I think. Normally, uh, HM Treasury is loath to agree to any number 10 plans involving money and the Chancellor. So, um, yeah, what do you think? So they're suggesting that it's the Treasury that's the problem. Oh, in fact, what, what I would say about the Treasury is that I couldn't wish for a better partner when it comes to the challenges that so I this have. this is wrong? I, I don't recognise that at all okay. because, actually, I, I can tell you personally from you know, having been Chancellor, you know, having a close relationship with the Treasury, having a strong partnership for any department is, is crucial. And right now for health and care, I'm just really pleased we've got that really good working relationship. You talked about the NHS backlog getting worse before it gets better. When is it going to get better? It's hard to know because of the, the, Years, the people that have stayed months. away. It's, it's really hard to put a number on that. And we, you know, I've asked that question myself, of course, of our friends in the NHS. And what they will the rightly, response? well, they rightly will come back to me and say, look, a lot of it depends on how many people come back. You know, what's the, of those people that stayed away, the eight to nine million, what proportion of them, you know, come back to the NHS? And as I said, and I can't be clear, and I, I would like to say this if I can, just make clear to your viewers that if you're one of those people that, you know, for whatever reason, you're, you weren't feeling well and you stayed away from the NHS because you were told to, because you did the right thing during the pandemic, you know, please come forward and the NHS is there. But it will, of course, mean that the NHS will, 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 will have to you know, rightly uh, deal with that, find the, the the, the investments and, and you know, the procedures to deal with that. But the record amount that we're putting into the NHS, that's an extra two billion went in this year just for elective procedures, another eight billion over the next three years. That's gonna pay for something like an, at least an additional nine million more scans and tests and procedures. And we'll be able to you know, deal with many, many more people. Is it not gonna be an extra 12 billion a year into the national health and, um, and social care, given that that's how much the national insurance is? Yes, I'm, I'm just referring to the the, the money that's ring fenced for elective care. Of okay, course, got the it. NHS does, does a lot more than that. Okay. Um, is the money that is from the national insurance increase, all of that money is going to the NHS and social care, not going anywhere else? The levy is all NHS and social care. Forever. It's, 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 it, well, it's health and social care. It's broadly health and yeah. social care. So it includes, for example, spending on vaccines. But it won't be hived yeah. off anywhere else. It's, it's just. It's, for... it's, a, it's, a, it's a health and social care levy. So I heard one of your colleagues at the weekend saying, for now. It's a health and social care levy. The, the Treasury's been very clear about that. OK. Um, let's move on, should we, and talk about um, Jimmy Savile. Uh, the row over Jimmy Savile has caused all sorts of problems. Um, the slur against uh, Keir Starmer. In fact, one member of the Downing Street team uh, resigned, as a, she says, mm. as, a, as a direct result of that. Should the Prime Minister apologise to the Labour leader? Look, I, I, first of all, I understand the sensitivities around this. And this is why the, the Prime Minister himself, after he said what he said in Parliament, has clarified his remarks. And, and really, I think that's all there is to this now. And that, uh, you know, I think we should we just try to move on from this. There's so much else uh, that is going on. And I think that we should draw a line under this issue and just try to move on, because the Prime Minister has come forward and clarified his let's remarks. Just say, let's just remind our viewers what he actually said in the House of Commons. This leader of the opposition, a former 
Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr. Speaker, or famously, who spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile. Outrageous. Well, I don't know if you've got the other clip, which was, I think, a couple of days later, where the Prime Minister did clarify his remarks. He clarified, he didn't apologise, and it's a well, slur. It, it's, 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 it's important that he, he rightly set out said what it? he meant. It doesn't, it's not, you know, I wasn't, it has to, to I wasn't there responding to, to the report. So it, the Prime Minister has said what he wanted to say, and, and subsequently he's come forward and clarified those remarks. Okay, and that's this what is that what Rishi Sunak said. Can we listen to that? Here we go. Being honest, I wouldn't have said it, and I'm glad that the Prime Minister clarified what he meant. So he's happy to say that he shouldn't have said it? He's also pleased the Prime Minister clarified the remarks. I don't know, do you want to play the clip of the Prime Minister clarifying the remarks? Have what we, we, want we, have to we do. got that? Can we play that, please? Alistair, I think you're fine, it's my show. All right. What we well, have okay, got, well, so it's, what it's we interesting you're not you. showing that. What we have got is you. Keir Starmer, when he was running the, the, the DPP, you know, did, did a good job and he should be respected for it. It's a tough job and he should he deserve absolute respect. You're getting a bit testy about this. Why are you so testy about it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that it's. It, of course, it is a sensitive issue. I, I get that, and that is why of that, that is victims are furious. Th that, that is why the the prime minister rightly, I think it was a, just a couple of days later, you know, made made it clear it what Blackpool, he meant yeah. and also what he didn't mean. He, yeah. he came and said that, and that was right. And 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 right now. You know, hopefully you'll understand your views on that. Isn't, this isn't the issue that I'm focused it on. You know, I'm, I, I'm focused on my work at the department, which could not be more important. We've talked and we've about, talked about the it quite NHS, a lot. So let's about move. We've so talked about it COVID, quite a lot. Social care. But one member of staff who, who had been loyal to the prime minister for ten years, she stepped down because of the fact that he wouldn't apologise, even though she told him to. We heard what Rishi Sunak said. Uh, he says he wouldn't say it. You have said, um, as we illustrated there as well, that you know Keir Starmer um, has your support. Why will this Prime Minister not apologise when it's blatantly obvious sometimes that he just should? Well, look, I, I can't add anything more than I've already said. He's clarified uh, the remarks, and I think that's really... It's the right thing to do, and I think hopefully we can draw a line under this because he's been really clear about what he meant and what he did not mean. Okay. And, that, and that, I think, was really important. OK, would you have said it? It's not about me. It's not. It's not I'm about me. You. No, it's not. It's, You're it's sat no, here in front not. of me now. I'm asking you. Would you have said it? No, it's. It's not about me. I'm not the one there responding uh, to to the report. Okay. You know, I I'm responsible for what I say, and and yeah. I think I've been very clear. About so, this. Mr. Sunak was wrong to say what he said then. But you have to get Mr. Sunak in and ask him. Well, try every week. What can I tell you? Keep trying. Yeah, I will. Uh, Downing Street has been described as uh, dysfunctional and needing a shake up. A shake up. Dysfunctional and needing a shake up. Um, how would you? Describe Downing Street over the last two years. Um, it's, well, we've achieved as a as a government, and obviously Downing Street at the heart of that. A lot has been achieved. I mean, Downing Street, if you want to call it that, or government more broadly, we have uh, you know, protected this country was from Corbynism. We've delivered on Brexit. No, was it dysfunctional? No, it's not something I would have recognised. But when my my own. Uh, work with Downing Street would have been quite limited. The, uh, but the changes that are now being made is what the Prime Minister, he had promised this, in response to the update from Sue Gray, where Sue Gray herself, I don't remember the exact words in her, in her recent report, but she had talked about the fragmented relationship, for example, between the Cabinet Office... Said lots which of is, other stuff which as is, well, She said lots of stuff. But in terms of Downing Street, she talked about the fragmented relationship between the Cabinet Office and Downing okay. Street and the need to make changes. So I think the changes that the Prime Minister's announced, in particular the appointment of Steve Barclay, you know, a very strong individual, yeah, very capable... People don't know who that is, so it's not... You but, know, but it's someone... It's so someone that who, means nothing to my view. But, it, but it is someone who understands the Cabinet Office He's got and now having that link with yeah. Downing Street now will, will I'm not be gonna, crucial. I'm not going down that rabbit hole. What I am going to say is a report say the Prime Minister has told his allies that critics will need a tank division to oust him from number 10. Um, it's an honour to serve. It's not a birthright. Of course it's an honour. It's an honour so to serve as any, any minister. Well, it doesn't, just because someone said that doesn't mean... You can true. hear him saying it. Oh, well, I've never heard that, so, you know, this is just some speculation in the okay. press. You shouldn't believe everything you read in the press, Kate. Well, I don't. I don't. I don't also believe everything that politicians tell me either. Well. Moving on. Carrie Johnson was your special advisor when you were business secretary. You've seen the comments about her in the book uh, by Lord Ashcroft at the weekend. Is this misogyny? Pretty yes. Simple. Yes, it is. It's sexist. I mean, it's why... First of all, I think the partners of politicians should be off limits. There's no... Why would you go after attack 
the partners of politicians. And by all means, go after the politicians. But why their wives, their husbands, or their their partners? And because they encourage them to break lockdown rules, I suppose. Well, no. This is uh, th this is not what this is about. This is just about going after an individual. I actually do think it's, uh, there's a sexism involved in this. That's right. And, I mean, I really do. I I, I do think this. And uh, and I, I would I just think doing this, you know, going after in this case, you're going after Carrie Johnson is it's undignified, it's unfair, and it's just wrong. Mm. This is her statement. Actually, she she's put out a statement of on her behalf. Um, here we go. Yet again, Mrs Johnson has been targeted by a brutal briefing campaign against her by enemies of her husband. This is just the latest attempt by bitter ex-officials to discredit her. I suppose that's a reference also to Dominic Cummings, who's apparently going to make more uh, revelations later on today. She is a private individual who plays no role in government. You would second that? Yes. Well, do you think Sherry Blair played a role in government? Do you think? think uh, did, do you think? Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, your normal major she, she played was, a role in government? I'll play you know, devil's advocate so, because you, you know, know, I, they have I'm... no formal role in government, and so uh, this is absolutely correct. She was a, a Conservative Party. Um, she worked in Conservative Party Central Office, I think, previously. So she she was she quite was, active within the party. Not. I'm trying to play devil's advocate. I mean, I, yeah. I also don't. She think it's she was, as part. you say, she was my special advisor. Yeah. She was an excellent special advisor, but she's not in government in any way. Uh, uh, she has no formal role in, in government, mm -hmm. and her, uh, to the extent she would have any anything to discuss with her husband to do with government, would be any different from anyone before her. So why is she any different to anyone that came before her as a partner of a prime minister? And what would you say to Lord Ashcroft and Dominic Cummings and the like? Well, I, 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 I would just say that you know, if you want to. You know, talk about number ten, these issues. By all means, please do so. But you know, focus on the prime minister. Um, we all want to uh, be successful in life, don't we? We all have ambitions and goals. Do you do you want to be a leadership contender? You're going to tell me there's no. You're going to tell me there's no vacancy. I've, Every, there's I've so been many... there and I've done that. Yeah. And I'm just focused on my job. And I'm really, as you said, it's an honour to be in government in any role. It's a, it was an honour for me when the Prime Minister invited me to take on this job at the time that he yeah. did in the middle of a pandemic. And, uh, and that is a, it's a privilege. Every day I wake up and think of it as a privilege and I do everything I can to help. Can you rule out completely a leadership bid? I don't think there's going to be a leadership Did, election. I really, I don't, and I don't think there's going to be it's a leadership election because we've got a leader. Can in you place. rule out a leadership? We've bid? got a leader in place <laughs> not that's doing out. a excellent job. He's getting on with the job. He's delivering on all the commitments that we made, and I'm there to support him alongside the rest of the cabinet. Can you rule out a leadership bid? There's no leadership election. <laughs> it's good to talk to you. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed for joining. I told you I wouldn't mention Sue Gray or the Met. Yeah, chalk that one down. Thank you very much. It's <laughs> great you. to talk to you. Thanks very much. A uh, quick look at what's happening as far as the papers are concerned this morning. That story that has now been debunked uh, by the Health Secretary, the Telegraph, saying the Treasury has blocked a multi-billion pound plan to deal with the NHS backlog. Backlog. I don't know whose teeth I've got in today. Hogwash, says the um, Health Secretary, which was due to be announced today. The Guardian reports that half a million people face delays in seeing a cancer specialist due to overstretched NHS waiting lists. Tory rebels could number 100 in any confidence vote. That's according to the eye. How would they know, I suppose, would be the follow-up question. It also says the Prime Minister's wife has slammed claims she has too much control over government policy, claiming bitter ex-aides are behind the allegations. The French President Emmanuel Macron is heading to Moscow today for talks with President Putin. He hopes an open dialogue can prevent Russian conflict in Ukraine. Let's get more on that, should we? Our security and defence editor, Deborah, is in Kiev for us this morning. Um, hello to you, Deborah. Good morning, good morning. Um, what's going to happen? Well, I mean, this meeting, it's again another bit of uh, shuttle diplomacy, which we've been seeing an awful lot of over the last few weeks. But it comes on the back of warnings from U.S. officials that Russia now has about 70 percent of the combat power needed were it to, to want to launch a full invasion of Ukraine. And also the U.S. National Security Advisor saying an attack in whatever form could happen at any moment. So really high stakes as the French president heads to Moscow. He'll be meeting, like you said, with President Putin. He does still believe that dialogue can perhaps uh, prevent further conflict. He's also then, off the back of that meeting, going to come here to Kiev tomorrow. And at the same time, you've got the new German le leader, Germany, and also a key player here, going off to Washington today to meet with the US president.
OK, thanks very much indeed. Oh, the weather looks horrible there, Deborah. Yeah, it's pretty miserable. <laughs> I can see that. Go in and get a cup of tea. We'll talk to you in the next hour. Thank you. Quick look at what's happening uh, in the next hour on the programme. Speaking to a cyber security expert about the consequences for Britain if that conflict between Russia and Ukraine develops. 26 years on, a confession from serial killer Levi Belfield over the murders of Lynn and Meghan Russell could show there's been a miscarriage of justice. Speaking to the barrister and legal commentator Chris Dorr. And could the pandemic be entering an end game in Europe? The World Health Organization thinks so. We'll speak to the WHO's special envoy for COVID-19, Dr. Navarro, of course. Meantime, some good news to bring you. Australia has announced plans to reopen its borders to all fully vaccinated travellers next week, or week after, a fortnight today, in fact. Uh, Siobhan is standing by for us. Hi, Siobhan, tell us more. Morning, Kay. Well, we heard last week New Zealand setting out their timeline to reopen. And today, Australia has been talking more about easing its restrictions. So from the 21st of February, business travellers and people with visas who are double jabbed will be allowed entry to Australia. Now, the double jabbing is really important, underlined by Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who, of course, uh, made an example of Novak Djokovic, who we saw being deported last month because he wasn't vaccinated against coronavirus. So you have to be double jabbed. If you aren't, you're going to have to present a medical certificate and get an exemption before you travel. But good news here for both um, the tourist industry and, of course, the airlines as well, who've been dealing with one of the strictest set of restrictions in the world since March 2020. And I don't think this easing is any surprise, really. We've seen Australia dealing with its biggest coronavirus outbreak since November, despite the restrictions. And also, it's worth bearing in mind with any of these announcements that this is an election year for Scott Morrison. And of course, more lockdowns would be very unpopular. OK, thank you, Siobhan. Thank you. Also making news for you on the programme this morning, GCSE and A-level pupils will be told in advance what topics will appear in this summer's exams. Examiners will also be asked to make their marking more lenient this year because so many young people have had their schooling disrupted by the pandemic. Police in the Canadian city of Ottawa have made seven arrests from what protesters are calling the Freedom Convoy after roads in the city were blocked with vehicles and tents. They say there are more than 60 criminal investigations so far related to the demonstration. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has warned China to respect the sovereignty of the Falkland Islands. Where have we heard that before? Her comments came after the Chinese president agreed a statement of cooperation with Argentina, which included support for Argentina's claim to the islands. Should just mention at this stage, shouldn't I, that if you are expecting to hear from the Education Secretary today, I'll ask the Education Secretary. Sadly, as you'll know, um, he did test positive for COVID last week. He has been uh, quite poorly, so we couldn't um, get him to come into the studio, obviously still recovering from COVID today. We're hoping to do that uh, very soon indeed. As soon as we have a firm date, we will let you know. What we can tell you about, though, is that gun salutes are taking place at midday in London and Edinburgh today to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Iva standing by for us at the Wellington Barracks in central London. Hi, Iva. Good morning. Why are you there? Hi, morning, Kate. So, yes, today really marks the start of the celebrations in this Platinum Jubilee year. There'll be gun salutes at various locations uh, at midday in Green Park, and that'll be a 41 gun salute carried out by the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery, who are based here at Wellington Barracks. Now, they've been up since four o'clock this morning, polishing all their gear. Soon they'll be tacking up their horses. They are at the moment, the troops having breakfast, but the horses are over here. This is Windermere. Hello, girl. She is one of 71 who are taking part. She's been showing us a lot of interest since we've been here this morning. Uh, now, as I say, there'll be gun salutes at various locations, also in Scotland and Edinburgh and also at the Tower of London. Now, the Queen herself, to mark the occasion, she was at Sandringham Estate uh, yesterday, from where Buckingham Palace issued a series of photographs showing uh, Her Majesty's working from her red boxes, those official ministerial red boxes, um, emphasising, I think, the fact that despite her recent health concerns, she is still very much an active working monarch, even after all these years on the throne, 70 years on the throne, a platinum jubilee. OK, thank you. Thanks a lot. Obviously, we'll bring uh, more of that to you throughout the course of the day here on Sky News, including that gun salute.
Now, there's a new twist in the case of the tennis star Peng Shui, who has denied that she ever accused anyone of assault. I'm sure she did. Maybe she didn't. Tom's standing by for us. Tom, tell us more. Morning, Kay. Uh, well, just to remind you of this whole saga, in November, Peng Shui put a post on Weibo, Chinese social media, saying she'd be sexually assaulted by Zhang Gaoli, a very high-ranking Communist Party official. That post was removed. Her account was censored. We didn't hear from her for two weeks. And she has been making reappearances since then, but they always seem to be tightly controlled. What's happened today is that Le Keep, uh, the French sports paper, has the first independent uh, media interview with her. Uh, and she's gone a bit further. We have heard more details. Details. So just to take you back to that November post on Weibo, Peng Shui wrote that I didn't agree to have sex with you, referring to Zhang Gaoli, and I kept crying that afternoon. She told Le Keep, I never said anyone sexually assaulted me. Now, she hasn't denied writing that post, and it's a bit frustrating there wasn't more follow-up uh, in that interview to ask about the meaning of those words. She uses this word be in Chinese, which means pressure or force or compel, but it probably doesn't meet the definition or the common understanding here of what constitutes sexual assault. But we didn't have that follow-up, and this was a very tightly controlled interview. There was an official from the Chinese Olympic Committee sitting in. Lekeep had to send their questions in advance. There are still these questions about how free, whether she is under duress, uh, when it comes to speaking to media. There have been these appearances. Everyone of them reveals a bit more detail, but perhaps raises another question rather than answers it. OK. I can recognise the bird's nest there behind you, famous during the... Uh, Beijing Olympics 2008, of course, they're hosting the Winter Olympics at the moment, aren't they? They are, and they had the opening ceremony at the Bird's Nest here again uh, on Friday night, and it is now in full swing. Uh, there's been a lot of action today already. The first story, I think, for uh, British viewers as well would be uh, Kirsty Muir, who's um, only 17 years old and has done fantastically well. She's qualified uh, for the final of the Ski Big Air. That's the huge jump over in the west of the city, where also Eileen Gu, who's become the face of the Olympics. She was America. She was born and raised in America um, before switching allegiance to China. She'll also be competing in the finals. Um, there was disappointment for another American skier, uh, um, Katie Schroffen, who uh, sat, she was defending her Olympic title but crashed out. She didn't finish, so she won't be able to uh, go for gold uh, or compete any further. But I think you know one of the better stories we've heard is that of uh, Canadian athlete Max Parrott. He won the gold in the men's snowboard uh, slope style, which is a fantastic event. You sort of combine all sorts of tricks. Only three years ago, he was diagnosed with cancer. He went through 12 rounds of chemotherapy, uh, and he described his winning run as the best run of my life. Fantastic. Um, I'm absolutely riveted to the uh, games, as usual, um, particularly the curling. Is that your sort of area of expertise there, Tom? I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't say I'm an expert curler. It's getting quite popular here in Beijing. Team GB will also be taking part in that today. We already knew they were in the semi-finals. Uh, they had another match against the USA, which they won pretty comfortably, and that means they'll be facing Norway, um, who beat them earlier in the group stages, um, although that match didn't count for as much. So that, for them, is an opportunity to lock in silver, at least, and maybe give them a shot at gold. OK. See, there's nothing this man doesn't know. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we're used to upsets in the FA Cup, aren't we? And the less fancied teams didn't disappoint. With Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. A wild and windy weekend. Weather remains changeable this week with signs of a colder spell settling in. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Also, this caught my eye, actually, over the weekend. He's quite a crafty little parrot, this one, in New Zealand. There you go. What he did was he land, He actually stole the GoPro. Uh, it was a camera from a family resting during a trek. And in the process gave us a stunning bird's-eye view of the Fjordland National Park in New Zealand. Uh, eventually, the parrot lost interest and dropped the camera. Um, the owner found it soon afterwards. How cool is that? Top stories for you. The Health Secretary says that the NHS backlog will keep rising before it comes down as plans to tackle the crisis are delayed after last-minute intervention from the Treasury. In other news, the French President Emmanuel Macron will today meet with Vladimir Putin in an attempt to find a diplomatic solution 
to the growing crisis between Russia and Ukraine. And Australia says it plans to fully reopen its borders for the first time in two years to fully vaccinated travellers. Tomorrow's here, another Monday, another challenging week for the Prime Minister. He had all sorts of resignations to deal with last week, didn't he? Where is he with the contenders who might want his job and who definitely he's got rid of them? Morning, yes. Turbulent end to the week for the Prime Minister. His policy chief, Munira Mirza, who's worked for him for 14 years, announced she was quitting over this issue of what the Prime Minister said about Jimmy Savile, or more specifically, his refusal to apologise. That resignation letter uh, got leaked. And then a load of other officials who we expected to go, perhaps as a result of the Partygate scandal, all out of the door quicker than expected. So the Prime Minister lost his head of communications. Uh, he lost various other key people in Downing Street. We've had a couple of new appointments over the weekend, which he hopes will help to reset things and bed in this new team. And what about a leadership challenge? It's interesting. I was asking uh, Sajid Javid. He, he said that you know, he, he gave me the line about, yeah, no job uh, opportunity, no job vacancy, yada, yada. But he was definitely not completely ruling himself out. Didn't completely rule himself out. Of course, he ran last time. And I think the Prime Minister just waits to see whether the threshold of letters comes in. We had another two over the weekend, uh, one from uh, Charles Walker MP, another one from, uh, you see, Nick Gibb, who's fourth uh, from the left uh, at the t on the top row. The he's sort of unassuming former schools minister. These are not people who are constant critics of the Prime Minister, you know, in TV studios all the time. It doesn't seem to be particularly coordinated, but these are all the MPs, all men actually, who have so far confirmed uh, and including Caroline Noakes at the top there, letters of no confidence having gone in. But um, they, there may be many others behind the scenes who have, because they don't have to tell us this is a secret process. And if we hit that number 54, then there will be a vote of no confidence. Somebody I else think Downing Street brace for that. Right. Somebody else who's behind the scenes, um, to all intents and purposes, is Carrie Johnson. Um, she's being criticised again in the papers at the weekend. Uh, she used to work for Sajid Javid, of course, didn't she? And I did put to him whether he felt... Well, this is what I said to him. Is this misogyny? Yes. Very simple. Yes, it is. It's sexist. I mean, it's why... First of all, I think the partners of politicians should be off limits. There's no... Why would you go after or attack the partners of politicians? And by all means, go after the politicians, but why their wives, their husbands or their, their partners? And because they encourage them to break lockdown rules, I suppose. Well, no, this is, uh, th this is not what this is about. This is just about going after an individual. I actually do think it's, uh, there's a sexism involved in this. That's right. And, I mean, I really do. I, I, I do think this. And, uh, and I, I, would, I just think doing this, you know, going after, in this case, you're going after Carrie Johnson is it's undignified, it's unfair and it's just wrong. So this is the response to a new book by the Conservative peer Lord Ashcroft called First Lady, which is about Carrie Johnson. It's being serialised in a major newspaper and he's claiming that she has undue influence over the Prime Minister who is trying to control everything in number 10. And in the words of Lord Ashcroft, her behaviour is preventing Boris Johnson from leading as effectively as voters deserve. Now, there's been quite a storm of criticism about this book, including from uh, Sajid Javid, who uh, used to ha have Carrie Johnson working for him when he was communities. Secretary saying, well, look, this is on the Prime Minister and Mrs Johnson can't defend herself. Mrs Johnson's spokesman actually hit back this weekend mm -hmm. saying that she was a victim of brutal briefings by her husband's enemies uh, and she's had quite a lot of support, including from Michael Gove's uh, ex-wife, Sarah Vine, who says, you know, this is in the end about the Prime Minister and his judgment. OK, for now, tomorrow. Thank you. Tomorrow's take at nine o'clock. See you then. Looking forward to it. Now, with tensions between Russia and the West worsening over threats to Ukraine's border, cybersecurity experts fear Britain could fall victim to cyber attacks if Moscow decides to invade. Professor Kieran Martin is the former head of the National Cyber Security Centre, and he joins us now. Hello to you. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. How worried should the UK be about cyber attacks from Russia? Thanks for having me. I think in the last month, both the US and UK governments have issued warnings effectively saying be on heightened alert, but stopping well short of trying to spread panic. I don't think it's likely that Russia will do something completely unprecedented towards the UK um, that it hasn't done before. But 
there are two real risks. One is, as tensions mount, and if Russia does take further military action in Ukraine, you can expect that to be accompanied by heavy cyber attacks against Ukraine. We've been caught up almost literally in the crossfire of those before when they've gone a bit wrong and they've hit networks in the West and caused large amounts of economic damage. The other risk um, is that Russia harbors an awful lot of very damaging cyber crime. We see that with hacks on British schools, local authorities. We saw it on the Irish healthcare system. Uh, last year, the US energy uh, system. And Russia can take its foot off the, um, the neck of some of these criminals sometimes if it suits them. And if they are in a state of tension with the West, even greater tension with the West than they already are, then they can perhaps tacitly encourage some of these criminals to cause us a little bit more discomfort. So it's a time to be um, alert to cyber risks, but not one, but not panic. How common are these cyber attacks? Do we always hear about them? Well, there are a whole range of cyber attacks ranging from sort of pretty common petty criminality, which sometimes you hear about when they cause disruption. But a country like Russia can do very sophisticated uh, attacks in several ways. It will do very sophisticated spying, and you can expect that all the time, particularly at a time of tension uh, now. And that can involve commercial interests as well as uh, government um, uh, uh, interests. Uh, Russia does do something, it's called pre-positioning. It's just a technical term for lurking in networks so that if tensions get worse, they can perhaps exploit uh, those. So there's a full sort of range, full spectrum of cyber attacks ranging from the very basic to the quite um, sophisticated. And they are at it all the time, but they're at it for particular reasons. And as things potentially get worse, and hopefully they don't, but if they do, and we have to be prepared, um, th there will be severe cyber um, activity against Ukraine, and that has potentially repercussions for us. How easy is it to tell whether it's Russia or North Korea that's responsible for cyber attack? It depends what it is. So if there was one of those very um, damaging cyber attacks, like taking out an energy plant which, um, or taking out power supply, which Russia has done at least twice against Ukraine in Kiev in 2015 and 2016, there are very few countries that have both the intent and capability to do that, because that's, qu that be, that's quite hard to do. Um, so if Russia was to launch a very deliberate disruptive attack against the UK, it's probable, it's not certain, but it's probable that we could detect that it's uh, Russia. Some of these more criminal attacks, the attacks where criminals try and extort money, but that disrupts healthcare or education or ordinary business, they can be harder uh, to prove. Now, we know over pain, um, painstaking analysis over a number of years that a lot of it comes from Russia, but it's easier for Russia to deny that, that sort of um, attack. So it depends, it depends what it is. OK, it's good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed for the explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Now, another eyewitness report from our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, uh, on what life is like for those who've dared to stand up to the ruling Taliban in Afghanistan. Political opponents are now in prison or have disappeared and children as young as 12 find themselves behind bars. Alex sent this report from inside Herat Prison in western Afghanistan. The Taliban now run the prisons and we're given rare access to the main jail in Herat. The prison governor wants to show us how well the Taliban are running their justice system. And we're escorted by him and his gunmen the entire visit. The men here have all been deemed criminals by the Taliban. Hey. Salam alaikum. The cells we're shown have around 40 men jammed together. Many have been here for months already and they're accused of stealing, adultery, not paying debts and fraud. The prison governor is behind us, so they answer our questions cautiously. But one with a fresh injury tells us many are employees of the former government. He says they've been put here without proof or trials. The governor tells our interpreter not to translate before we're moved on. We're being told not to ask them any more questions and uh, to leave. The Taliban promised an amnesty for those who worked with the foreign troops or the government they toppled. But our evidence suggests this is not being applied. Instead, there are widespread claims that those now behind bars are only there because of multiple vendettas being carried out instead. The governor used to run a secret Taliban prison before they came to power. 
His office may be different, but human rights groups are worried he's using the same old techniques. He and his men are implicated in the disappearance of the female governor of the women's prison. Alia Azizi disappeared more than four months ago, and she's not been seen since. And the governor admits to us he personally rang her to come to work. He says he's no idea where she is, but insists she was corrupt, and she's probably claimed asylum elsewhere. Alia Azizi's family are frantic about her. They knew her prison uniform made her a Taliban target. Her career portfolio shows how closely she worked with the foreign troops once based in Afghanistan. And her husband utterly refutes all the allegations against her. If she was going to leave, she'd have contacted me by now, he says. It's all a lie. He's gone to the capital to try to find her. The Taliban warned him not to talk publicly about her. Now he's decided he has to. At first we thought the Taliban had changed, he says, but they're the same old Taliban doing the same things. God only knows what's going to happen to our country. There's still worrying evidence that human rights continue to be disregarded. We found children locked up in Herat prison too. What did you, what did you steal? A bicycle, he says. A number of others said they too had been locked up for weeks for stealing bikes. How are you getting on? We don't like no thing here. We don't like nothing here, he says. And while children are locked up and those seen as Taliban critics continue to disappear inside these prisons, there'll be concerns over those holding the power in this country. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Afghanistan. And we'll have a special edition of Sky News tonight focused on the crisis in Afghanistan, featuring more of Alex's reporting and asking how the world can help save the country from collapse. That's Afghanistan, the fight for survival. Sky News uh, tonight's special at 7pm. 26 years ago, mother and daughter Lynn and Megan Russell were murdered as they walked down a country lane in Kent. Known drug addict Michael Stone is currently serving a life sentence for their deaths, but now serial killer Levi Belfield has confessed to their murders. So, what happens next? Barrister and legal commentator Chris Dorr is with us. Hi, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Uh, where do we stand legally on this? What happens next now? Belfield has said what he said. Well, first of all, I mean, I think everyone will appreciate that the police and all of the authorities will act with considerable caution on the, the word of a convicted serial killer. Uh, the police describe him as a manipulative narcissist, and I, I, I imagine that that's 100% on the money. Uh, in terms of the process, the, there is an appeal for Michael Stone already sitting with the Criminal Cases Review Commission. Stone, of course, was originally convicted, and then he was cleared on appeal, and then convicted again on a retrial, and has attempted to appeal um, on several occasions in the past. But this is clearly new material. The Criminal Cases Review Commission will consider it. They will, of course, consider whether, and indeed the police will consider whether an interview with uh, Belfield is required. And ultimately, the police in particular, but also the Criminal Cases Review Commission, will have to make a judgment as to whether this evidence is credible or not. So they will be looking at the fine detail of what he's saying to see whether he may have got information from the public domain to, as it were, fabricate a confession. Because let's not forget that Belfield has nothing to lose. He's serving life without the possibility of ever being released a whole life term, so he could confess to a thousand murders, and it's not going to make any difference to him. Uh, so they're going to have to check very carefully whether the story that he tells matches the evidence, and matches evidence perhaps that's not in the public domain, but there really can't be much of that left because, uh, of course, of those two trials that Stone has faced over the years. Yeah. Uh, why, even if he it, it has got a full life tariff, why would he confess to a murder that he hadn't done? Well, people do. I mean, I've been involved in, in, in cases over the years where uh, I had a, a case where someone was serving eight life sentences uh, and admitted to other crimes in which, frankly, he couldn't possibly have been involved. Um, and people do, um, for all sorts of reasons. In Belfield, in Belfield's case, as the police said, he's a narcissist. He loves attention. He enjoys the publicity, weirdly and perversely. And so you can't put anything past him. I mean, this could be just something that he, that he you know, summons up on a Sunday morning to try and get some um, uh, publicity. And, of course, he's being very successful because we're having this uh, conversation now. But equally, of course, from the Stone point of view, Stone has always protested his innocence. It's very rare, actually, 
for people in Stone's position to maintain their innocence for so long in the face of trial after trial and year after year in prison, um, that's a very unusual situation. So you have you have the situation of one person protesting his innocence. That's going to have to be looked at very carefully. But you have to have a very significant um, caution around whatever Belfield might say. Yeah. Either way, spending the rest of his life in jail. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the programme. Thank you. Now, could it be the beginning of the end for COVID in Europe? The World Health Organization says the continent could soon enter a long period of tranquility in the pandemic. They say this period of higher immune protection should be seen as a ceasefire as opposed to the end of the war. Joining us is the WHO Special Envoy for the Global COVID-19 Response and Chair of Global Health at Imperial College, Dr Nabara, of course. Hello to you, Doctor. It's always great to see you. It's a ceasefire, but not the end of the war. Is that how you would see it in Europe? Good morning, Kay. Yes, I, I must say that I find myself quite, quite connected to these comments. I mean, everywhere in the world is experiencing COVID in slightly different ways right now. It all depends on what the virus is doing and how people are able to respond and, and where they are. And right now in Europe, it, it does feel as though things are moving into a better space. I mean, what really needs to happen is that the system to deal with infectious diseases works, and it works behind the scenes, and we get fewer surprises. It means that everywhere people who are at risk should be protected with vaccines, that there should be a, a, a routine effort to prevent transmission where it's building up, uh, and that at the same time, we prepare for the surges. And so, yes, if we can get that system constantly working and do it invisibly, then it will be a period of tranquility. It won't be ceasefire because the virus is still there, but it will be really enlightened and smart defence. How are these vaccines and boosters getting on against the um, COVID and, and uh, the various variants? We know that a senior uh, cabinet minister um, has had he's totally vaccinated and yet he still contracted it. Yes, so the new variants can break through and infect people even when they've been vaccinated. And in some people, the protection from vaccines wears off a bit quicker than others. We've known that about these sorts of viruses before. And so inevitably, there will be some breakthroughs. The great thing is that the vaccines that are in use right now actually prevent people from getting severely ill and really reduce the risk of death. So we've got a way of making sure right now that people are much less likely to die when they get COVID. And that's part of the tranquility that uh, the WHO European Regional Director referred to the other day. I think you told me last time we were chatting that one of your grandchildren had contracted COVID. How are they doing? Yes, yeah, so the grandchildren are fine, the family is all well, but I must say that I'm sure that viewers will appreciate what my experience, and that is that COVID really is everywhere, and it seems to be moving around in schools a lot, and then the children bring it home and the adults get infected. Quite scary for older adults, but that seems to be the pattern right now, and uh, it's it's... It's not easy because the kids can get quite poorly, but at least in my family, nobody's had any really untoward consequences. And we're thankful for that. It's always great to talk to you, Doctor. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. And Thank greetings you. to everybody. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, let's have a look at some of the pictures making the morning's papers, should we? Here we go. One or two for you. Um, starting with The Telegraph. This dramatic picture of a firefighter walking past a bushfire in a railway town in Western Australia. My goodness. Uh, for the bird lovers out there, very good morning to you. This one, love it. The Daily Mail has this story of a 71-year-old swan whisperer from Dorset who visits the local river so much that the swans have grown accustomed to his presence. Nothing at all to do with the food that he's got in his hands. And the Mirror has this spread of the Hazmat Olympics showing the extremely stringent COVID measures in place in Beijing during the Winter Olympics. Shaken, not stared. And The Guardian has this stunning shot of the setting sun over the channel. Wow, that's an amazing picture. I absolutely love that. I think it might have popped a filter on that. What do you think?
I don't know. I may be being a little bit unkind.